Welcome for another Café Rollist, another pleasant moment, uh, hopefully, uh, I'm pretty sure, with uh, a very pleasant individual from the t tabletop RPG community, uh, community uh, specifically in London. Welcome among us, Naomi. Hi, everybody. Is it? I'm streaming live from my home, where I have been for what seems like an age. <laughs> it's... Oh, wait a second. I lost the... No. Wait, no. How do I resume it? There, it's back. Yeah. Oh, I just realized something about... Uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, as I was saying, it, it's a bit informal. Yeah, a, a lot of my guests at the moment, for some reason, some reason, I don't know why, but they all end up being at home. Yeah, we have some there. time on our hands. So actually, it's a good segue for me to uh, use our ice-breaking questions, which mm -hmm. are in those uh, rather peculiar time. What is your current routine, if it's not... Well, first of all, maybe introduce oh, yourself. Oh, boy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Naomi. I wear many hats. Uh, the hats I tend to wear is I am the chair of No More Damsels. Um, we try and bring more women, trans people, and non-binary people into the RPG space. Um, and the other thing I do is I'm on a very silly, low-quality podcast called Power Word Roll um, that is just about to have its finale released, uh, and I will be finishing the editing on that straight after this. Um, as far as routine goes, um, last night I didn't go to bed till about three um, because I started painting, which has been my stopping myself from chewing at the walls activity um, and i like, kind of lost a lot of time painting like henry cavill or painting uh, uh no painting like canvases nice so i'm doing a forest scene at the moment and i'm thinking about putting a robot in it for, for sparkle um but then at three o'clock i heard the rat that lives in my kitchen uh trying to chew his way through my cupboard so then uh it was rat dealing with time so that's how my life is going here in this Small London flat by myself. Yeah. Uh, well, I say myself. The rat is also here, and he ate three poison bricks last night. So um, he seems unkillable as yet. I'm thinking about buying a bear trap. Okay. Maybe? So when you, when you said a rat, you didn't mean a domestic rat, which would be your pet. You mean a actual uh, sewer rat. I have a cupboard with a chair and like three boxes, like slammed up against it to stop him from coming out where I thought he was coming out of. Wow, okay. Uh, okay, <laughs> impressive. <laughs> well, that that might lead to the next question. Have you developed a new hobby or a new skill uh, in this My time of seclusion? skill is listening for rats, it seems. <laughs> I think there's just one. Uh, but previously, he managed to eat an entire uh, packet of digestives that was sealed and on a high shelf. And he dragged it all the way across the floor, as well as burying his way through a loaf. So, um, so all of my stuff is like at the top of a bookshelf, food-wise. Uh, Hobby-wise, it's been a lot of editing for me, um, just trying to keep the stuff going. But this weekend is the New Zealand 48-hour film festival, and they're doing a special lockdown edition. So I'm going to try and make a three-minute short film by myself. Wow. Uh, without my face being in it, preferably. So... Yeah, my, my own sort of hobby at the moment is doing TikToks, so it's not... Ah, uh, yes. There's a bit of editing, and yesterday I even made one with a kind of a special effect because I, I made a mock-up myself behind a, a book, so I could film myself, and in the background it looked like another character I sort of made up was busy reading a book, and it was just a bunch of balloons with a hoodie on top of it. Uh, very gonna... good, very good. But uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, when uh, Persephilia, my wife, uh, interrupted me, uh, busy doing that, uh, she she was less than impressed uh, to... <laughs> about the death I'm going to to do those TikToks. Yeah, my um, my partner has two little boys, and the oldest one is into TikToks. Um, but mostly his are they need some creative work. But he keeps showing me TikToks. I'm like, babe, these are just vines that have been recut. I've seen this. This is like seven years old. He's like, no, no, it's new. It's new. And I'm like, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh, oh. 
Yeah, TikTok is kind of a merging of vines and it evolved also and musically. Musically, yeah, which was supposed about uh lip lip syncing some music and but now you got forms of comedy there either using music or segment of music and having a joke around them or even segments of comedy bits of or audio from from movies like like one which got popular with the the last star wars i think it's was well, probably i'm pretty sure it's kylo ren who had the line saying uh shoot that f uh piece of junk out of the sky and and people f f shoot themselves as as batman flying and then the riddler <laughs> would good. be the one saying shoot that the piece of junk out of the sky and, and so on very good but actually i will be uh Tell, well, I will. My next panel on the road is present next. The one next month will be about TikTok. It will be about tabletop role playing fans on TikTok. So I've got three uh, charming uh, TikTokers who will be joining me and uh, wow. trying to explain what it's about. Which is very difficult because it's mainly jokes which are based on repetition. So if you explain it, you just kill completely the kill joke. The joke. And, it's uh, trying to be hip with the kids and being hip with the kids is it's just a constant battle but it's the funny thing at the moment with the quarantine is that i was already among let's say the older demographics there um, thank god i was not the only one but there's definitely been a wave of 30 somethings 40 somethings and even older people <laughs> moving onto the platform and doing their own thing and uh, being 30 plus or 40 plus in itself is a is a subject of making videos and and jokes uh, all, all around the the platform so yeah that that I would know <laughs> it's easier to use than final cut <laughs> fair fair enough but uh, yeah you mentioned editing actually uh would you be interested since if you have any kind of free time i'm always looking for talented and dedicated tabletop rpg podcasters to volunteer to host and edit a rpg academy film studies those are kind of popular they are yeah, the sure. so if you if you're interested if you volunteer you're the one who picked the movie and you pick yeah the, i did um i did one with kaiju fm so we oh. did uh, crimson peak which is a film that i absolutely love um, in fact, uh, I, I was asked to pick a film and I think I picked six and it was one of the ones that he hadn't seen, but God, it's a beautiful film. And I, Is that the I actually Benicio, studied. The, no, not Benicio. Um, uh, what's no, his no, name? No, no. Um, Mexican. Now that you've said it. I, uh, yeah. Guillermo uh, del Toro. There yeah, we go. Guillermo del Toro. Yeah, it was yeah. An, a very interesting visual movie, uh. Yeah, I was a bit confused. I like that Guillermo del Toro is like, I will write a whole setting just so I can create this really awesome shot of bloody footprints in the snow. Yeah. I, I did Cinema 101 at university, and let me tell you, we watched some weird films. <laughs> um, but like Crimson Peak has always been one of my favorites for just like the cinematography of it. Yeah, I would love to rewatch it because I, I remember seeing it in theater, and it, it really went out of everybody's radar now nobody nobody discuss it very much i find yeah i i have this thing of that there are films that i like that i will happily rewatch and rewatch and rewatch again and that's definitely one of them that i would like to rewatch maybe every couple of years and just be like ah oh, it's a great film so would would you pick this one again for the rpg academy film studies or would you pick another one no, I feel like I've done it. I would probably pick Shape of Water, I think, because I that's also a very good, another Guillermo del Toro film that I really like. Um, and I think it's a lot lighter than Crimson Peak. Crimson Peak pulls so much on, um, like, gothic horror, which is which is great, and it's very evocative and very moody. But I like, I've, I've always really enjoyed, like, B-monster movies, and I like that Shape of Water is um, basically the creature from the Black Cagoon, but as if it went backwards. And The Creature from the Black Cagoon, I think a lot of people who've watched it now in the modern age are like, ah, oh, I feel bad for The Creature in the, back the Black Lagoon. It just he's so lonely. And Shape of Water is like, I will fix that problem. Don't you worry. Yeah, it's and I like that it has a death 
um, well, a mute main character. I really like that. I think that's cool. Yeah, it seems a very interesting movie, and you're you're right. Monsters they they tend to be flipped around. In the other way around, I haven't seen it yet, but uh, apparently the last Invisible Man is interesting, and it, it, it's kind of the opposite, I guess. It's the Invisible Man was the hero, and now it's the the monster, really. I think it's kind of like uh, another one of those um, Jodie Foster movies where she's like. My kid is missing, and no one will believe me that he exists. <laughs> I f I feel like it kind of like taps into that same vein of traumatized mother comedy. Like I don't want to say comedy; I want to say thriller. I guess you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I I'm trying to read as little as possible about it because I I feel it's the kind of movie you can spoil yourself. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, I. I I'd like I'd like to do a film studies also uh, soon, but uh, I'm not sure which movie. Uh, the the problem I tend to I tend to to pick movies depending on guests. So I want to discuss specific movies with specific guests. So That's fair. I, I try to reach out the authors of um, a, a tabletop role playing game called Rosenstrasse, which is okay, not one I'm familiar with. It's well, it's very. Um, well, it's very niche. Uh, it's even, it's all, you know, it's it's at the the border between a quotation mark regular tabletop role playing game and something you would use as a um, what is the word? Um, like uh, therapeutic script writing tool, or uh, not writing tool, but more therapeutic or pedagogic. Oh right, tool. yeah. Because you... you play and it's developed by professionals. You play. Uh, individuals who are in Rosenstrasse, which ap apparently was a, a place which existed uh, and a story which uh, happened in Germany uh, at the dawn and into World War II, and it's about it's about the Holocaust. So it's it's very very serious theme. It's very uh, emotional, but it's again it's uh, is it still a tabletop role playing? game or it's more a tabletop role workshop for people to process a number of emotions or try to empathize with with history and <coughs> i'd really like to have one of them to discuss about a movie set in world war ii and discuss what's appropriate or what is not appropriate yeah. to do with history think... and, and what conditions to do so I think modern wise, I think Jojo Rabbit would be a good call for that because that is like as a way of doing comedy about a very, very serious subject. Um, it's both very enjoyable and very difficult to watch in places. Mm. Um, and uh, I am a crier when it comes to films and I did bawl my eyes out um during it but i also laughed very hard and obviously because the director is a kiwi i have to promote it that's that's my job i'm, I'm not allowed to not promote it so I, I, I forgot that that you you're actually from new zealand yourself yeah i'm sort of 50 50 so my dad's from new zealand my mum's from scotland they met on a ski slope in austria <laughs> and we lived in the uk until i was about 14, 13, 14, and then moved over to New Zealand and lived there till about four years ago now, I think. Um, so yeah, it's kind of been, it's, it's quite weird. It's very weird at the moment because obviously New Zealand is a pretty good place to be quarantine wise. Um, but I couldn't get home. I literally, there just wasn't enough time before the borders closed to, to like, make the decision of quarantining here or in New Zealand. Um, but it's a lot of family Zoom calls. My sister has gone into the mountains to be safe. Wow. So she's living in a place where there's no washing machine. You have to put your clothes on one of those like ribby things and then put it through a, a squidger to get all the water out of it. And she's chopping firewood and stuff. It's very weird. It's very weird. Wow. I actually receive a... Uh invitation to apply for a job in New Zealand, a recruiter there who wanted me to join the transport authority in New Zealand. 
<laughs> okay, uh, fair enough. I'm unemployed at the moment. Uh, I was before the quarantine, and uh, I'm. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you know, thank you very much for your interest. I told them if they accept remote working, eventually I would do it. But uh, yeah, I, I don't feel leaving my uh, my apartment. I somehow miraculously managed to have ownership of in London to to go to New Zealand yet. Um, but yeah. coming coming back on the movie, country the... for like retiring. Mm. You know, if you're. But it is very far away from things. And if you want to do anything with somebody who lives in England, it has to be first thing in the morning or last thing at night because of time difference. When yeah, I, I first moved over, I played D&D &D with my old group in New Zealand at five in the morning for like many, many months until my body just was like, I can't, I can't do five in the morning for D&D &D anymore. I'm sorry. Yeah, actually, I double checked because I was like, hang on a minute, how far is it? And I realized that New Zealand is quite literally the antipodean point from London on the world. So yeah. it, the, the actual real antipodean point is, is somewhere in the, 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 the sea, in the, the water. The ocean, yeah. The ocean. But, but everybody claims New Zealand as it's one of the few land masses out that way. Yeah, it's the closest to, 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 to this point uh, compared to London. So, yeah, it's quite um, quite... Uh, something, yeah. No, the the movie I had in mind because I always try to showcase uh, a bit like you with New Zealand uh, directors. I try to showcase continental directors or yeah. European directors. So I was thinking of a movie. Oh, I forgot the the English name. I I don't think the, the the movie is known at all in English. But I found a copy with subtitles for for my guest. It's it's about it's a it's a comedy. It's again. That's why I thought it lent its way quite well. Uh, but it, yeah, it, it's one of those. It's not the the most uh, outrageous one. Uh, this one is quite uh, tame. It's it's not inappropriate. But there was this weird vein of World War Two comedies in the fifties and sixties, which were produced in France. Uh, and and this one is is very good. It's about uh, two two individuals from the black market walking through Paris at night, which is empty, with suitcases uh, full of meat for the black market, and they're just transporters. And uh, yeah, they run into uh, into the butcher who, f who gives them the the meat, and yeah, of course, there's different stuff which happen. Uh, so yeah, that's one I I'd like to to showcase, uh, which is less known, which is not a good yes, idea no. at the same time. Because yeah. it's the most popular. Have you ever seen the film Le Huit Femme? Oh, can you repeat that? Le Huit Femme, the eight woman. Oh yeah, it rings a bell. I think it's I so that. weird. It's probably one of my favorite, like just like off the wall French films. Uh, it's about it's it's basically a um, locked in a room murder mystery. Uh, there's they're snowed in. There's all these women in a house. And the head of the household dies, and it's just these eight women trying to figure out who did it. Except halfway through, it turns into a musical. It's very weird. It's very weird. It's joyously hilarious, and I enjoyed it a lot. But also, it's one of those movies where you get halfway through, and you're like, what? What is going on? Yeah, it's from François Ozon, who's a... He's not even mm. a director who usually do musical comedies, but... Uh... He he really tries a lot of different stuff. That's that's kind of that's kind of cool. Um, you were mentioning playing D and D with uh, your friends in in New Zealand uh, when you moved here to London. So when did you move from doing that at five in the morning to actually engage uh, to actually engaging with the the local community of role players? Uh, I was doing both from pretty early on. Um, the first when I first moved to London, I had to just sort of decide to go by myself to a club and hope that it figured out. So I used to travel from uh, Putney to Lewisham to play a game of Monster Hearts uh, with my good friend Phil um, and a couple of other girls. Um, and then at night, it would take me two and a half hours to bus back to my flat 
Well, Lewisham um, is far. I like roleplay, Evan, <laughs> but uh, Lewisham is very far. Yeah, I, I also play D and D in a group in Waterloo uh, with the lovely Peter, who now runs the Crit UK um, Facebook pages on the mods there, um, and that was also very very good fun. Um, and then now I've been running sort of home stuff. Uh, I ran two games over the weekend for London RPG community, which was a lot of fun. Um, so I ran Lasers and Feelings, uh, A Marriage of Inconvenience, uh, in which all of the characters lost or exchanged body parts, which is very, very enjoyable, um, through a lot of failed roles. I think one of the players said that she only succeeded once during the whole game, but it was, also, it was still a lot of fun. And then we did uh, the Wild West, which was Lazy and Feelings hack, because Lazy and Feelings is a very good system. Um, and that was also very good. It's evil twins and uh, a bank heist and a town in the Wild West where there's no whiskey. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. And I played Monster Hearts and I also played Dialect, which is really interesting, which I'd not played before, which is about lost languages. Is the lasers and feeling hack? Uh, is it is it Cat who was running that? And it's whiskey and uh, or it's something else? No, no, this was one that I was running. Okay. Um, so I was running, I was running Guns and Guile, but I recalled it Grits and Guile because I have run it before, and my players are like, I would like to solve every problem with my gun, <laughs> which can make it <laughs> quite difficult. When when we did that, it was um, it was a train heist. There was a sheriff who was asking for their help, but they'd all made characters who weren't interested in helping the sheriff. So the sheriff had to die, and then they were like, oh my god, he has children. And then he had this locket with hundreds of children. They were like, why does he have so many children? And it just it went off the rails. The person they were trying to save was supposedly his daughter. But then we decided that she was actually the daughter of the main villain who had a scar and an eye patch and a hook hand. And the little girl also had a scar and an eye patch in the hook handle. Yeah, it's good. I think I was supposed to play with you last weekend uh, at the um, uh, convention by uh, London RPG community. But last minute, da uh, Dasha called me to play uh, in her own game, which was my second choice. Uh, because she didn't ah, have yeah, quite yeah. enough players and I was happy to, to make the, the, the swap. <laughs> yeah, but... I, was, I, was, I was not selfless enough i was like i, I really i really want to play a sexy teenage monster i'm sorry <laughs> but yeah it was quite cool. i'm sure she will be running it again have you tried her game yeah. uh, already yet i have not actually um we've been playing a lot of uh jackbox as of late and we're talking about doing a paranoia game cool hi thinking emoji <laughs> thanks for checking in i see you Oh yeah, hello. Uh, I should be uh? <laughs> paying more attention to the the chat room. Do we have a lot of people? Oh yeah, we got a a couple. Well, thinking emoji, feel free to to drop us a question uh, if you if you have any. Uh, what was I about to ask? Uh, yeah, RPGs. Nope. Sorry. I was just gonna say dialect was the last thing that I was gonna say. Is it was a very cool system. It was quite interesting to play a very narrative heavy game. There were no dice rolls. There were some cards. Um, but I thought that was a really interesting system, just as a way of exploring an idea through the idea of making a new language. It was cool. Yeah, I heard of it also. It's one of those games. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure it's my thing because it's a bit too close. I don't do that at work, but I I design stuff as a group as part of my work so as part of the leisure uh, it's not so much my fun ah well thinking a japanese manga series so thinking, i have not so thinking just to clarify for people who just have the audio not the the, the visual uh thinking emoji is asking us if we've seen b stars i have not i've seen people mention it on tiktok apparently it's Rather shocking at, in episode two or three or something like that. <laughs> um, I can give you my opinion on uh, one of my favorite like early animes, which is Haran High School Host Club, which is very enjoyable. 
It was just a very, very silly, enjoyable anime. I find that um, I liked, shoot, big guy, Attack on Titan. There we go. <laughs> big giants of creepy faces. I like Attack on Titan, but I find it kind of a lot. You know, it's so brutal. I'm just like, oh, that was, that was an episode. I feel like I need to look at some puppies or something now. <laughs> I really love love uh, Attack on Titan. Also, uh, I haven't checked. There's a there's a spin-off show uh, which is set in a in a high school, and it's it's all sh uh, chibi things. An anime set in a high school? Oh my god! But based on Attack on Titan, so it's the character of Attack on Titan, but uh, doing wacky things in a in a high school. Assassination Classroom also very good. I only watched the first episode. Like... I need to continue it, and I I think I, I there's a season, a whole season of One Punch Man. I haven't seen the second one. Uh, what else have I been? Mean? Yeah, I, I I haven't watched it for a while. But uh, for a while, coming back from work just to to relax, I was looking. I was watching uh, Love Live, which is <laughs> <laughs> the story of college girls uh, forming a what do you call that, a idol band. So uh, you see them training and so on, and then uh, it's very... Uh, a very good anime concept. Whimsical and uh, singing songs and very light and uh, relaxing. That was a kind of suiting. But there, there's, there was so much on, on Crunchyroll to, to check out. Uh, mm. At the moment, it's more Disney+. Plus and and Studio Ghibli also on Netflix, of course. Uh, I'm very happy my son uh, likes Ponyo very much. So he's, and Totoro, and uh, so he's been, and Porco Rosso, so he's been watching and watching those again, uh, which We've, was quite... uh, We tried to get our two boys to watch Princess Mononoke, but they were just like, I don't, can we watch, can we watch Teen Titans instead? And I was like, well, we tried. <laughs> Mononoke is is kind of uh, and spirited away, uh, especially the beginning. It's kind of it's quite violent and and tough to to get your your head around. <laughs> Nana so, with has asked, "What's the dumbest character you've ever played? Dumbest character I've ever played? Dumbest um, in concept or dumbest in terms of? Oh God, there's uh, so many choices. Ability. <laughs> the dumbest character I've ever played. I think the first like RPG that I played that wasn't basically a D and D attempt. Um, I played uh, a teenage werewolf because that's kind of my jam. Um, and I hadn't, you know, when you first play an RPG and you're like, I can do anything. That was, that was my first mistake in that I can do anything. And I played a, I turned into a werewolf, I think in the middle of Las Vegas um, in a casino um and then i got taken out by the fbi and i was like i deserve that i deserve that but as far as like low impulse control very silly characters i think that was probably my top but the character i'm playing currently on the podcast is also not very bright but in a different way just like a bad decisions individual you know yeah at the moment the i'm editing the the fine the final episode of our, our mini series with uh, London RPG community playing in uh, the world of D and D in the world of Cantus, and uh, I believe uh, uh, Int Intel was my dumb stat for that character. Is I it... have played a game of uh, Demon World where it was like the second season, so the group had already played before, and I was jumping in sort of halfway. And they were like, so much stuff happened, this happened, this happened. And I was like, I cannot keep, I, I, there's so many threads here. And so I just decided to play uh, an, an orc with no intelligence um, so that I wouldn't have to, to follow understand the, the, the deep political machinations and could just sort of go as we went. Um, and I thought my name was Kilem, which, but it was actually because people kept yelling, kill him at me when I was in my orc fights and I was like they, they yell my name they yell kill him over and over again and everyone's like <laughs> oh no oh no it's underrated to play low intelligence character because it's on, so on, fun on, it's very fun and even 
what I what I especially enjoy it's to f when I do understand something which is going on and as the player I want to have my point across it's interesting to find convoluted ways to explain things or make a convincing point but going through the dumbest ways of doing yeah. so I also think dumb characters are great plot drivers so you can get away with um with a lot by by playing a dumb character. So when we first started the podcast, we'd all been playing D and D for quite a while, um, and I think that we kind of knew a bit too much as people about the way that specifically uh, Conrad writes traps uh, and writes things. We're like, we can't trust this man at all. But we had to, for the sake of the podcast, just dumb ourselves down a little bit. Because it's no fun to avoid conflict. Yeah, it's 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 a bit annoying when you are on a table when either the game master or the group of players make it so that you start to think very hard, a bit too hard about things. You start overthinking things. Yeah. The, the, the... Or if you're just too cautious as a group. Yes, exactly. Like, great, we avoided the entire story. That, that's, that's why one of the things I don't really like in role-playing games is planning a heist mm. when you end up planning it for so long and okay if you plan stuff right as you say you avoided the adventure and it's if... like you can plan a heist as much as you want but anything of more than two steps is gonna go wrong it's really i nice. forget anything that's a three-step plan you can guarantee that step three it's just out it's there's no point yeah no it's it, it there's no point doing that but you need this kind of trust between the players and the game master the, a sort of comfort that you you can go this way you're not doing complete nonsense necessarily you you're not overlooking the story but you're not being punished for for trying to to make things fun and uh, and move forward uh. yeah i think there's a lot to be said for character building um what we like to call pressure points so there should be there should be something in your life that your character will take a bullet for, and there should be something in your character's life that they will not deal with. And and then you give leverage to your GM or DM to make you interact with the story when they need to. Yeah, it's funny. I um, started a new campaign with a with my very first proper game master uh so the a bit like you with the people from new zealand but i hadn't played with the people uh i started playing with in belgium for 12 years around 12 years and because of playing online for their home group they invited me to to join back but uh on one hand in the questionnaire we got for a character there was well what would you do? be willing to die for so the the game masters got this pressure point but on the other end it was interesting to see you know i listen to a lot of podcasts i try to read a bit things about uh, how the practice of role playing has evolved advice to do things a bit better to to build this trust between game masters and players and uh, for for better and worse i find that game master who is a very good game master but at the same time he has not moved beyond what he was doing 12, even 20 years ago. And and the first session was very punitive in the way it was. And at the end it was, oh yeah, but it was it was a, a simulation. So you didn't die, you didn't do this. And, but it was a bit oh, like, yeah, I still three. spent, I still spent three to, f I mean, I spent at least half the, the encounter. It's, um, we were playing FBI, FBI agent entering a, a warehouse and I spent at least half the encounter under a pile of wood crates and conchers. Mm. And it's like, yeah, yeah, it's that's that's not fun. And in the end it was, oh, you see, no? it's, uh, it's dangerous to do uh, something like that. Uh, no, you know, for moving forward in the campaign, you're like, yeah, I think everybody's going to be stressed out now. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's something to be said for um, actually, the best way of saying this is I, my New Zealand GM um, always used to say that the player characters are the only one of their type. So mm. if your character is a druid of the moon, they are like 
the only druid of the moon of their like stature you have to set them apart early to to make them feel like these are not just cogs in a machine but these are interesting characters you know experiencing an adventure that matters or something that seems uh to have world impact rather than just um I am doing a thing and then once I'm done the job, I will stop doing it. You know, mm. it, it adds an emotional weight. It's it's different being a cleric of a god to being the only cleric of a god makes, you know, gives you a different perspective on how important your calling is, which I thought was really good. Yeah, I guess it's uh, at the same time we are, I mean, on one hand, we play contemporary adventure when we are... Uh, trainees getting out of the FBI Academy, so we're not supposed to be the craziest, uh, I don't know, Black Widow type of character being the best in the world. But on the other hand, we, we, should, still, we should still be the center of the story uh, somehow, you know, carry the narration forward. And I guess, I guess the approach of the Game Master is kind of a bit more like Game of Thrones-ish. The, right, yeah, the idea, yeah. yeah, you can die any time because, because life sucks. And uh, yeah, on one hand, I get it. On the other, it's... it's. You have to go in knowing that that's what you're in for. Yeah, that's the thing. I think it's about... Uh, and yeah, at least the, the first session was, was very clear about that. And yeah, it, it was a reminder for me. So, so I'm buying into that. But I, yeah, I... I Getting out of any session, even with the greatest game masters, and, and this one again is one of the, the my favorites. Uh, I, I cannot help to to go out and try to make uh, not, not criticism. Of course, they sound in technically they are criticism, but it's more s stuff teachings that I'm trying to take for for myself if I try to run something later. I think I think we learn lots of things from other people, and I think that there's definitely a thing of gaming style mm, yeah. so um i know for me personally i'm i'm very good at one shots but i'm very bad at campaigns because i'm not a slow burn thread subtle kind of person you know i i, I i'm more of a movie than a tv series like that's kind of how my gming style works and and i often find that that means that i'm quite bad at investigative games because they require a lot of subtlety. They require you to think about clues and stages. Um, and I think that that's something that you kind of work on over time. Um, but but part of that is also knowing what, what you enjoy and what your players are going to enjoy. Um, I don't think anybody's coming to me for like a big world building epic experience. But if, if you want to kill a man with only a banjo and some silly putty then i am your girl and that is fine you know I yeah i think that's sometimes something which is missing in the you know the the sort of pundits of tabletop role playing the advice or everything you read and hear on podcasts on youtube uh, often advice on like there's a good advice and bad advice and and i find there's a lot of things which are said which just don't apply to everyone uh, i and learn the lesson sort of the hard way that agency sharing is not really my thing or the thing of the players I play with. I don't mean in a sense that we don't share agency at all, but each time I try, and maybe I was not doing it the right way or I don't know, but each time I try to give a lot of agency to front end things with a lot of, of agency with my players, they tend to freeze and, and even it was interesting when I was at La Guilde des Rollis Francophones de Londres, the, the French-speaking role players of London, because all the people there were game masters at a table, and then they would be players at another table. And I realized that it was not even a question of people's abilities to, to care for the story, for instance, or make up things. It was sort of a question of their intent and availability when they were showing up for the table. So when I was running yeah. my game, I could improvise stuff, make up story, but as the game master. But when I was showing up and I would see other game masters show up as players at table, their mindset was, 
I don't want to think of that today. Uh, my mindset is that I want to be my character. That's it. I don't want to make up things. I'm just here to be first person, immersed, and and react to things, not not create things so much. Which yeah. which which is either good or bad. I find partially about group dynamics because I definitely noticed that doing it online is very different because it's much harder to read who's you know who's ready to talk or who wants to to sort of add there's a lot more um sort of dead air if you're not careful because you're trying to make sure that you're not talking over other people and giving everybody a chance um and i think that part of that is people trying to find the rhythm of the group and figure out who's gonna speak first i'm not sure i don't know these people kind of that vibe also i think adds to it so yeah I, i've found something that's worked for me that i haven't really been doing before um for this weekend i made maps so i made a map of some planets and a map of the cowboy town and then i just put a load of landmarks on it and so there was clearly i clearly put a thing in front of the players and was like something is weird here something is happening but where you go to deal with that is up to you, which I've not done before because I'm generally quite a linear game master. Um, but I found this worked out quite well for me to kind of give more choice to the players without overwhelming myself. So that's interesting. Usually you are, you are not... What you're describing is to some extent a, a bit uh, of... Um, oh, I forgot my word. Sandboxy. sandboxy. A little bit more sandboxy. Sandboxy. Uh, and you say you're linear, but uh, from what you describe and what I know a bit uh, of you, you sound like you're, you're linear, but you're not set in your story. You're dynamic linear. You sort of uh, move yeah. things and swap well, things around quite... the, the characters. Yeah, what I quite often like to do, especially with sci-fi, is I just, I know I know all the moving parts, and then I just, the end is an ethical dilemma. So how the characters solve it is up to them. Like, I don't, I don't have an ending or a solution written. So one that I've run quite a lot is, there's a boy in a box, um, the, the town tells you that you have to sacrifice him to stop a catastrophe from befalling everybody who's there so it's basically an advanced trolley problem to yeah. be honest like it's <laughs> it's one person you have bonded with or many many strangers and what is your choice but obviously it's it's because it's a, a game it's it's never really a choice you know it's not like a board game or uh or like chess or something where you only have a limited set of moves you're only limited by what you think you can get away with, to be honest. Um, and people have like sacrificed themselves or like swap positions or they've, you know, people take different things depending on the group that they're in. And it's only once where I've had a group uh, be like, well, we have to sacrifice the boy to save all these people. And that's only happened once. Uh, but when I told the players afterwards, you're the only group who's ever done this, they were shocked. They were like, you mean we, we didn't have to? And I'm like, no, no, you <laughs> never have to do anything. Uh, but it, it's, it's interesting how people react to a dilemma like that. And I think because we play heroes, we're very heavily on the side of generally an individualistic mindset of we are the heroes, we care about this person, we must save them. Like that's how, the, that's how it works. But it doesn't have to. Yeah, I'm thinking again of what you were mentioning about uh, TV shows, long format versus movie. Uh, mm. uh, my own sweet spot, and it's interesting. It's 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 kind of in between of what you're saying. My BBC can, miniseries. Yeah, it can it can be it can it can be a movie or uh, it can be a one shot. But my my favorite is uh, episodic. So it can be long format, but it needs to start with a banger. It needs to be somewhat short, yeah. like the episode of a TV show. It needs to start with a banger and finish with sort of a cliffhanger. And it needs to be yeah. intense. That's why I really like 
running and playing at London RPG community because they got their three hours format and I, I've learned so much from that format and and now when I play games which are longer uh, it, it really drains me you know the, the four to six hours game and and at the same time you waste so much time doing the thing of making the journey in person without it really having any meaningful impact to the story you just plow through a lot of things there's yeah. a lot of snow, slow burn but it's not even a slow you can play with slow burn but but it's kind of a de facto slow burn it's not a fl slow burn Plus. that the narrator thought of and is building upon yeah. towards something i've always played like three hour oh. sessions pretty much um we we sometimes do longer for recordings because we need to get a certain to a certain point um, in the story for for the episodes. Um, but we have discovered if we don't take a break halfway through, we get very bad. If we if we don't stop for pizza halfway through the recording, the second half is just garbage, and we're like, well, we have to do that again because it wasn't our best work. Got to be honest, you know. And and I find that giving yourself more time if you're trying to create a punchy storyline doesn't often help you obviously our for power word role we do 30 minute episodes because like that is the length of a tv show 30 to 45 minutes minus ads you know or or your commute and i think limiting ourselves to that format of we know that once an hour we have to have a good story beat in our game because that's going to be an episode and it kind of it's it's creating the heart of an episode around an event that actually makes us, I think, better at storytelling because we're looking for those those episode moments that will define an episode. So through each game, there has to be three like punchy highs and lows for us to work the episode around. It's it's a different way of playing. It's not like playing uh, around the table so much. There is definitely like an an element of thinking about the output. Um, it's very interesting. But we're still to, idiots, so it, it's, it's very interesting to play in a like like I did a bit uh, with streaming uh, for Encounter Roleplay or, or Scraticus Academy. It's interesting to play in a entertainer mindset, not not but yeah. you play literally an entertainer, which is a, with a bard and uh, does these crazy thing. But what do you got against bards? You, What's you, wrong with bards? You dare, and both the game master and you, you you not only you dare to keep the story move forward but you try to feed something exciting for the people in the chat room uh to to Sorry, react I just, I've just seen the chat <laughs> and i'm just like wow there's some stuff in there yeah no, it's, thinking emoji yeah it was regarding uh beast wars apparently the the shocking thing uh episode two or three years Regarding okay. a word I will not pronounce uh, here, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, lo I love Japan. I love uh, Japan animation, but uh, yeah, sometimes it's uh, from uh, fan service to darker subjects. Uh, it can be either interesting or slightly not as appropriate, <laughs> not, not very appropriate. Talking of things uh, that are not appropriate, let's leave that topic. Um, and just let the boy die. Thank you. Uh, in that case, um, I wanted to say about quarantine, mm -hmm. um, since obviously everyone's locked down and it's time to listen to podcasts and stuff, um, that it's really a good time to go on Itch.io and try a new RPG. You know, it, it's definitely a time to support creators. And I kind of wanted to just, you know, do that, do that thing of um, it takes a lot of time out of our day to make podcasts and things. And there's a lot of people making some really, really cool, new, interesting RPGs. Um, dialect for one, I, I found was really interesting. Um, and there's lots of cool creators that you should support in these difficult times, you know, uh, Buy a piece of D and D merch on Etsy. <laughs> like, go and get yourself a new D and D T shirt and buy it from somebody who is not a big company. And that was that's kind of that's kind of the the thing that I wanted to drop in today. 
because you... obviously we're all out here making content and you know it's it's hard and it's time consuming um but people do it because they love it and there's a lot of queer and like women and people of color out there making like really cool content that i think that we could be supporting for there... example adventures wanted yeah, exactly. currently Give us some a examples. female-led stream uh that is very good so they are doing uh ever on terminus which i encourage you to check out it's a very cool like um chloe master who is running that is amazing um i know her permit uh, personally and i'm always blown away by her dedication um she's such a hard worker and she's such an amazing creative to deal with um i also really like uh rusty cool gaming is one that i would endorse uh it's very funny uh, my friend who hates podcasts says it's the only one she'll listen to that's not mine and she listens to mine because she loves me. So uh, there's no better endorsement than someone who hates podcasts saying that they like your podcast. And Rusty Cool Gaming is amazing. And obviously they do the Magnus Archives, which is phenomenal, a phenomenal piece of audio drama. Um, Wargaming wise, Bad Squiddo is out there making some cool minis and painting that you can go and get. And she makes queer ladies because um, obviously you could have a man or you could have a buff lady, and I am a strong believer in the buff lady demographic. Um, there's also, uh, I think it's on the shelf, there's a really good um, like collection of TTRPG uh, yeah. podcasts uh, run by people of colour and queer people that you can look through the archive and kind of see what jingles you jangles, um, and I'd really encourage you to do that at this time. The, yeah, the, you should uh, send me a list of that so I can include it in the description of the episode. But you're... I will. I will tweet about it after this. Uh, but the, I, I will. Um, I would say you're not tooting your own horn uh, enough. Uh, what is going on with No More Damsels? Uh, do you have anything uh, in store yeah. as we are stuck home? So, quarantine-wise, um, a lot of the team are kind of trying to look after themselves and their family at the moment because it, it has been, I think, quite difficult for a lot of people. Um, and obviously a lot of the work that we do is trying to build community and that can be quite difficult at this time. But however, uh, we are planning to do an online, kind of like the London RPG together at home, but more just to connect people and be like, hey, uh, here's some great queer and female and NB and trans GMs out, out here that you can play with and just to kind of encourage people who maybe would find it a bit more difficult in the general like D, D RPG space to find more people who they would actually you know really get along with and enjoy playing with and who share a lot of the same perspectives I guess so so that's in the works uh that will be coming out soon um and we're just kind of trying to support the people in our community more than anything else you know be there be available and let people know that stuff's still going on that obviously it's quite hard for a lot of people at the moment with cons being cancelled um and not being able to ship stuff so easily or um i guess be visible and be out doing the things that they would usually do so yeah so so no more damsels kind of working behind the scenes but we we not quite at announcement time yet but we will be soon awesome well uh, so. keep us posted and uh, we can uh, signal yes. boost you uh, as much uh, as and i can. have been told that i have to say uh i also do a podcast called power word roll that you should check out um it's it's girls and dudes and it's qu like queer and fun and the finale is out probably today cool so it's good stuff yeah i think the local community i'd like to try to have on those uh, you know informal cafe list thing uh, i think i'm gonna reach out to the people of uh, some game stores and uh, maybe a gaming cafe of london because i, I was wondering well, recently i can or... tell you that sorry i can tell you that bad moon still has primer for minis um so if you are going a little bit insane inside your house. Bad Moon Stars Primer, you can still paint as many minis as you can get your tiny little grubby hands on. 
that would be great because uh, I'm I'm very concerned about my friendly local game shop not struggling or not even reopening once this is over and uh yeah it's if you don't have uh, a... one of the things you can do is buy a voucher so buy a voucher for you to spend in store later so that puts money flow through now and then you can go in and buy a load of minis when lockdown is over um so it's quite a good way of helping creators who you maybe can't get to but you can still support and then you get your things when it's time but they have enough money flow to keep the lights on as it were that's a that's an excellent idea i had heard it for for movie theaters if you have a local independent movie theaters you can uh, uh pre-book uh, take take tickets and so on but yeah game shops having vouchers uh that would be nice i will put a link for bad moon cafe uh, in the description but uh yeah uh, actually, we're slowly running out of time. It's going to be about time I wake up my son from his uh, afternoon nap. Uh, it was great Very having gorgeous. you, Naomi. The conversation went uh, in a much uh, different <laughs> direction than I expected, but <laughs> that's cool. That was that was really nice to discuss. <laughs> that's how it be. <laughs> so, uh, do you have anything left uh, for to plug uh, before you go? And where can people find you if you wish to be found? Uh, and that includes people okay. who have only the audio so they, they won't see the the handle that's no uh... problem so uh i'm naomi you can find me on twitter at naomi thinks it uh the podcast is power word roll so that's at power power underscore word underscore roll or you can find us at powerwordroll.co.uk we have a website um and no more damsels is at nmd london um, you can find us at no more dancers rpg.org we also have a website it's very pretty um, and you can find resources there. So we provide uh, codes of conduct for your clubs. We provide safety tools. Uh, we have an excellent reading list of fantasy by uh, queer people of color and women, which is on there and available if you've got a little bit of spare time. I really endorse it. It's pretty cool. And it's put together by a real librarian. So it's extra, extra good. Um, and that's kind of my deal. And you can find us all over the place. Awesome. And uh, I will add to the plug, uh, you should go, people should go check the panel about diversity in fantasy setting, which was recorded at Dragon Meet with yourself, I believe. And Fiona yeah, from so What Am I Rolling? That was hosted by NMD London. Um, and we had uh, Anil uh, from Rusty Cool Gaming. Uh, we had some people from Adventures Wanted. I was on it. And we also had uh, a young lady who made a very important Lord of the Rings, uh, Lord of the Rings fan film, um, and is also making Ren the Girl with a Mark. So there's lots of cool stuff there, and it's Lord of the Rings rate related, which means I, as a New Zealander, have done my plug for my country. <laughs> and and uh, Fiona from What Am I Running, who was hosting, she she did a film studies with us. Uh, she picked District Nine and. It was quite cool to record that with her and uh, Mira from the podcast zone uh, also. I actually think both of them are waiting for their invite for this show, actually. So which, maybe which that'll show? be next week. This which, show. Café Roliste. Ah. Oh, really? Well, people should reach out. I, I've, I've said a couple <laughs> times that people should uh, reach me out if they, they wish to join rather than well, me. Well, let's be honest. Everybody's at home. Nobody's going anywhere. Why not? Why not? Yeah, yeah, but I don't know. Maybe not everybody is interested in joining me. Anyway, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, okay. Well, good idea. I'll try to have Mira and Fiona on the microphone. That will be awesome. Uh, thanks again, Naomi. Uh, everybody, please go, ch please go check uh, everything No More Damsels do. And uh, this was Café Rollist. Uh, if you want to check the 80 or so previous episodes, you can do so via Patreon. And uh, I'm considering right now looking into ways to make this content even more, slightly more public. I'm consulting my patrons uh, to see what they, they're happy with. And uh, yeah, maybe this will end up in uh, the podcast feed or something like that. But that should not discourage you to, uh, to uh, give a tiny, whiny, uh, doesn't matter how small support uh, to the Rollist on Patreon. Uh, that would allow me to do more like taking a better... Uh, internet provider so I can stream more because this kind <laughs> of be uh, is laggy often on stream. Thanks and uh, yeah, cheers, bye.
Bye.